All right. Uh, we've got Logan Chalmers now. Uh, kia ora, Logan. Good to kia see ora. you there. Uh, um, how's it go? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Awesome. It's going, it's going good. Um, so this is your chance to talk to us about your submission, and then we might have some questions. We've got up to 10 minutes, so over right. to you. Why don't I just jump into it? So I've been using and holding cryptocurrencies for about four, four or five years. I currently hold a couple of them. That's not really important. And I have a, a cautious exposure, and I want to sit, share my perspective and insight just from using it into how we should regulate and tax them. Uh, so I, I use, I've used cryptocurrencies to generate an investment return. That's pretty much what everyone does with them. Uh, they're really, uh, I'm going I'm to be quite cynical, but they're a, a, ve a vehicle of gambling, to be honest. Speculating and gambling can, can be fun. You know, you, you throw $70 into, a, into Dogecoin and you come up with, with a few thousand. That's fun. Uh, I also use them occasionally to engage in commerce. Uh, I view them as having a value in that you can evade sanctions and you can evade like predatory uh, transaction fees like TransferWise and those other remittance services. I can pay someone in Russia just as easily as I can send money to my friend and it'll, I know it'll be cleared in about an hour and then it's, it's their money. So there's a couple of, of myths I've seen perpetuated by like the Bitcoin people that uh, Bitcoin is a perfect, perfect money. It's a perfect store of value. I, I refute that. So the, the first uh, issue I take with um, one of the Bitcoin arguments is transparency. That We have a, a more transparent blockchain. That's great. We're all going to be, there'll be no more fraud in the world. But we, we now have a cryptocurrency called Monero. It's an emerging currency that's essentially completely private, unlike, unlike Bitcoin, where you can look at the blockchain, you can see what someone's been buying, how much money they have. You can now see nothing about Monero because you look at the Monero blockchain and you can see that there's a one in 11 chance that the person who sent the transaction is the person that you're looking at. It's very hidden. You can't see how much money someone has. You can't see where they sent it. You can't see who they sent it to. And there's now a, something called an atomic swap, which allows users of Bitcoin and Monero to swap without the need for any kind of third party exchange. You used to have like the New York Stock Exchange. It's, it can now be completely pair to pair. Uh, cryptocurrency is, is not the future. I, I reject that. It's, it's something a lot of Bitcoin people tend to say. Realistically, they create nothing of value. The value can only come from things that can be bought with them. And they're extremely expensive and terrible to use. If you, you compare them to gold, you see people compare them to gold. But the value of gold comes from the demand for gold, not the scarcity of gold. We have metals that are more scarce that are less valuable. And the price is massively inflated, which I view as a, as a significant risk to New Zealanders who are using Bitcoin and using other cryptocurrencies. The total market cap of all the cryptocurrencies last I checked was $2.6 trillion. So if we were to value that like a regular currency, we would need like cryptocurrency incorporated to make $134 billion a year in profit just to justify its valuation at a, a PE ratio of 20, which is a comfy PE ratio. They're also not an optimal way to move value. Blockchains are limited by the slowest computer in the network. The thing that makes them so secure is also the thing that makes them completely in impractical for regular usage. Uh, Bitcoin is highly decentralized and can only do 2,500 transactions for every 10 minutes. If they allow transactions to be sent to the network, it will become less secure as fewer computers can be part of the, part of the network if you, if you scale up the amount of transactions you can send. So if you, want to have, if you want to have Bitcoin doing something like Visa, you can really just have Visa servers because they're much better than like Joe's laptop running a Bitcoin node. Uh, as a result of this need to have many computers, the cryptocurrency is very slow. If you want to buy something with Bitcoin, it will take hours to clear. The price is also highly volatile, which makes it not suitable for regular transactions. Uh, just yesterday, the price of Bitcoin plummeted 10% overnight, and a few weeks ago, it did the exact same. Uh, anyone with exposure to Bitcoin has lost significant money in the, in the past few weeks. Uh, this volatility also means it's not suitable for buying things. You, nobody's buying their coffee with Bitcoin. It's, a, it's an obvious obvious thing that if you can't be with a currency, it's not a very good currency. Logan, I've, I've got a couple of people with questions here. Are you, you oh, happy to take questions? Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. Let's go to Andrew Bailey first and then Ingrid. Hey, thanks, Logan. A hey, very fascinating uh, submission. Hey, um, just one of the issues that you've raised, which we haven't heard before, is the, the time it takes to process. Um, so you quoted some stats here. So are you saying um, 
obviously uh, the slowest computer dictates how long it takes to process it. Um, so what would the stats just repeat how, how long it takes to take a transaction to occur? So with Bitcoin, you have, and, and all cryptocurrencies, you split up transactions into a block. So each block gets added one by one onto the blockchain. And so you can only add on Bitcoin, it's one megabyte. So they say we can send one megabyte to all the computers on our network every 10 minutes. And if we go faster, we're going to lose some of the network. So you can fit about 2,500 transactions into that one block that then gets put onto the network that everyone agrees to. And do you think um, the, the technologically this can be solved by, for instance, you can't just do it off your uh, phone or your laptop. You've got to increasingly you have to have hard powered computers to be able to operate on on the network. Will, will that be the likely reaction to that uh, as the number of transactions increase over time? I think it's limited to the world's ability to send data. So with Bitcoin, you have computers all over the world and you need to get this one block with all your transactions to so it. You're in saying a certain fiber, of the fiber is the issue as opposed to the, the processing power of the computer. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, you've got it. Five is the issue. Okay, let's go to Ingrid. Yeah, fascinating submission. Thank you. Um, in your opinion, Logan, if we were able to crack that nut in terms of data movement, um, how destabilizing would cryptocurrency be to, say, New Zealand's economy? What level would we need to get to in order to start to see it having a real impact on our, our financial stability? I think the danger with, with cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin is the loss of monetary control. Like if you look at, at the, the Greece debt crisis, they, they lost control over their currency. And when they, when they needed to do something like quantitative easing, they just couldn't. And they, it, it didn't go very well for them to, to give up monetary controls. All right. Can I ask a question as well? Um, and that's just a, it's a technical question. You talk the... Um, when the transaction occurs, you talk about all these computers having to validate it. I understand that. Um, is it the case that every computer on the network has to validate the transaction for it to then be authenticated or 51% whatever it might be? Or is it kind of a much smaller selection of computers, perhaps randomly selected? So every, every computer on the network runs has their own file that's the blockchain. And they can look at this file and they can go down it. And they can see, oh, this is who has money. And so you want to have the most up-to-date version of the blockchain. And if you don't have the most up-to-date version, then you can't really do your job as a validator because you'll get another block that's, that's sending money that someone doesn't have. And then you just get all confused and you can't be a part of the Bitcoin network anymore. Okay. All right. Um, is, any other questions there? Yeah. Could I, could I have one quick one, Duncan? Yep. Okay. So can you trade between... Um, cryptocurrencies, or do you have to go back to real money at some stage? You can trade between between crypt cryptocurrencies. It, on a network like Ethereum, they have uh, smart contracts, which are just computer files that everyone on the on the network runs that let you trade that kind of like an exchange that nobody controls. And then on different blockchains, like if you want to swap between the example I gave was Bitcoin and Monero, then there are there are ways to do that, but it's, it's not very widespread at the moment, but the, the technology is, is there at the moment for swapping cryptocurrencies without the need for any, any, anything like easy crypto. But if you, if you want to like get money from your bank account and onto Bitcoin, you, you, you probably will still need to go through an exchange or like give cash to someone who has Bitcoin for a so while. Generally, so it's still underwritten by the, um, the uh, conventional financial system at the moment. Yeah, the, but changing. the jargon is um, on-ramps and off-ramps for getting money into and out of cryptocurrencies. Because once it's in, you can swap it around quite easily out of like control of anyone. All, all right. Um, Logan, that's really interesting. And uh, mm. if I may say, charismatic submission. So uh, thank you very, very much for that. It's really, really useful. And you've got a prodigious amount of knowledge there. So thanks for your contribution. Awesome. Thank you.